Last May, um, I had the opportunity to be able to go to Kenya for 10 days and spend 10 days serving the Lord on a mission trip there. And during that time, we spent half of those times at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro working among a tribe called the Maasai tribe. While there, I had the opportunity to take this picture. I don't know if you guys can see this. Um, I took this picture while there. It was this one tree that was sitting on a hill at the foot of the Mount Kilimanjaro. I'm not a great photographer. Renning would say me and photography, those two words probably shouldn't even go in the same sentence. Um, um, but I fell in love with the picture um, and ended up putting it on this canvas, and we had it sitting at our house. I captured it just as the sun was setting. But there's another reason I fell in love with the picture. See, this tree is more than just a random tree that's on top of the hill uh, at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro. Every Sunday, under that tree, a group of believers would come and gather to sing to Jesus and learn from the Bible. The tree church, as they were called. They didn't have a building. They didn't have much property. They didn't have anything. But they would gather together, and you could hear them singing with joy and enthusiasm. And you can hear them um, clapping their hands and singing. They had this little drum that they would beat. But there was so much joy and excitement about them. The pastor could barely read, but what he could read during the week, he'd learn, and he would teach the people um, what God was teaching him. Many of these guys were new believers who encountered the love of Jesus and began to follow him. The pastor was a young guy with two kids, the um, age of my two oldest, and he was strong in his faith and passionate about his love for Jesus. The picture is special to me because 2012 was a hard year for me, both spiritually and in pastoring this church. There were many times last year I felt like we were headed nowhere and nothing we wanted to do was working. We would have great ideas, we would do great things, but nothing would succeed. People would come in every week, but they would never get connected or plugged in. And at the end of 2012, I had come to the point of burnout and wondering if God was calling me to lead this church in the year 2013 and 2014. I thought maybe God wanted me to start, and maybe someone else was supposed to kind of take it over and lead it into the next phase. And by the end of 2012, beginning of 2013, it was a period of incredible confusion for us. We had three, four invitations from different parts of the country to go pastor in different churches, and we were just like, God, what are you doing? It was a point where we didn't know what God was wanting us to do. Last December, um, Christmas week, I took a week off and told the guys at church, I was like, I'm not doing anything with the church this week. I'm just going to go hang out with the family and spend a week with my brother um, and his family in Virginia. And during that time, I kept asking God, God, what's next for us? A huge part of me wanted to see the church flourish. But the other part of me felt like, God, I've given everything and everything, and we're not getting any, anywhere to the next level. Maybe I'm the reason for it. And in that point of brokenness, I began to pray the prayer that we sang this morning, God, have your way. I told God that if he was leading us to go somewhere else, we'll be fine. But I'm going to come to the point where this is his church, and I would surrender and not stress about it. Let me be honest. That was one of the hardest prayers I've ever had to pray. Because for me, this was my baby. This was what I felt like God was telling me to start. And for me to pray that prayer was extremely difficult to say, God, this isn't mine anymore. This is yours. This is your work. This is your, this is your church. You've got to do it. I can't stress about it. I can't burn myself over it. You've got to work. And God began ripping the church from my clutch to the point where it wasn't my baby anymore. It was God's. And but God began to smash some idols in my life left and right. And it was painful, but at the same time, it was incredibly liberating. And so there are times when I would come, even this year, and I would say, God, why isn't the church growing? And I'd look over at the painting on the wall and say, you know what? My joy, my contentment, my satisfaction is not in how well this church does. It's in Jesus. My satisfaction is not in how well this church grows. I am a child of God, and in that, I should be satisfied. Last year, I would pray, God, bless this church. But in the back of my mind, I felt like I had to do everything to make it happen. However, stepping into this year, as God began to smash these idols, I began to 
pray specifically for areas and saying to God, God, these are areas you have to work because we've tried our best and it's not working. If you guys were with us in the beginning of the year, we spent two months and I'd constantly be up here listing seven or eight things that we need to be praying for as a church. And God's faithfully been answering those prayers over those last several months. I'm encouraged. Last week I was talking to someone here and said, the lady was saying, Loft is my family. Where last year would have been Loft is my church. This year it's Loft is my family. We're building community together. I'm encouraged that our elders, our leaders, and volunteers are stronger, more committed than ever before. God's opening new doors of ministry for us at a new apartment community. One of our own is moving into Camelot here in a week or two and will become the representative of Jesus and our church to that community. People from the community have started coming. Things that we have been praying for for two years and haven't been successful. In the last two to three months, God has been faithfully answering these prayers, but it started with coming to a point of brokenness of saying, have your own way. Listen, I share my struggle because the reality is all of, have, all of us have something in our lives that is competing for the place of God in our lives. Think about it. How would you fill in the blank in this statement? God, if you would just do this blank, then I will be happy and content. Or God, if you would just give me blank, then I would be happy and content. Can I suggest to you that whatever that you fill in the blank there is, if it's anything but Jesus... You have some idols in your life, and so do I. For me, my idol was to see this church grow. My idol was to be successful. And God had to smash those idols over this past year and work on it. Maybe for some of you, it's good health. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's good kids. Maybe it's a good job. Maybe it's a good boyfriend or a girlfriend or a spouse. Maybe it's money in the bank account. Whatever it is that you use to fill in that blank, that is your idol, and that is competing for the true joy and satisfaction and contentment that only Jesus can give you. This morning, I want to teach you guys to sing, have your own way, God. Have your own way. I want to challenge you today to stop asking God to bless what you're doing and start doing what he's already blessing. I want to encourage you that no matter what's going on in your life or in the world around you to pray, God, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Listen, God's will for us is his good and comprehensive will or purpose for all of creation, especially for our lives. The psalmist writes in the 33rd Psalm, the counsels of God stand forever and his purpose for all generations. The will of God falls into two categories. There is his revealed will, which we see in the Bible, but there's also his hidden will. There are some things in our lives that we will say, God, why are you doing this? And God will say, it's none of your business, that you don't need to know now. You will find out eventually, but you don't need to know now. There are some things that God will not tell you. See, it's our job to simply trust and obey even when we don't know why God is doing what he's doing. Solomon writes in Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. This trust factor is what this petition in the Lord's prayers is about. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The petition isn't so much about understanding God's will as much as it is about submitting to God's will. See, listen, that's where the rubber meets the road. It's one thing to suffer from biblical illiteracy where you don't know what God's will is for your life, but it's another thing to suffer from biblical indifference where you know what God is calling you to do and you choose not to do it. See, the text is so much more than just knowing and doing the will of God. It's about having a humble heart that submits to God's will even when God's will is not your will. What I've learned over the last year, which basic knowledge is God has a will for my life. He has a plan and purpose and desires of what he wants to do through my, through my life. At the same time, while God has a will for my life, on the other side, I have dreams and aspirations and goals for my life. And there comes a point where my will and God's will would conflict and at that point, either God's will or my will has to prevail. One has to conquer. To pray, your will be done, is to say, God, Father, let your will overrule my will. That makes this prayer, in my opinion, the most hardest prayer that we could ever pray. This is much harder prayer to pray than, 
God, heal me or provide for me, to pray, God, whatever you want to do with my life, do it. It is the most difficult prayer that we could ever pray. And listen, you can never walk and know God's will. If you want to do that, you have to get to that point of submission in your life. In John 7, Jesus says that if anyone desires to do God's will, he will know about my teachings, whether they're from God or whether I just made them up myself. In other words, if you want to know God's, the truth, you have to desire to do God's will. Basically, God doesn't reveal his will to you for entertainment purposes. He reveals his will to those who have predetermined in their minds that they're going to obey God no matter where God is calling them to do. To know and walk in God's will is to first bring your life to the throne of God's a throne of God and lay it at his feet and say, God, it doesn't matter what you do with my life, just have your way with my life. To do that, you can't submit to his will with bitter resentment or passive resignation. There has to be complete surrender. That's why Jesus in the Lord's Prayer says, pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How is God's will done in heaven. In heaven, angels don't wrestle with whether or not to do God's will. They just do it. In heaven, God's will is done immediately, not when it's convenient. In heaven, God's will is done eagerly, not half-heartedly. In heaven, God's will is done completely, not partially. In heaven, God's will is done perfectly, not when I feel like it. And Jesus says, this is how you are supposed to pray. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, when you look at your own life and when you look at culture and when you look at the things that don't happen according to the way that you think it's supposed to happen, you don't take matters into your own hands. You lay it at the Lord's feet and you say, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is saying clearly that righteous people, God's people, don't seek their own agendas, but they will constantly dedicate, uh, constantly submit themselves to the will of God and say, God, whatever you want to do with me, do it as you please. But to be able to do that, there are some things that need to happen in our heart. There are some things that need to happen in our lives. There are three things that we need to see happen in our hearts for us to be able to pray, God, have your way in my life. Number one, in order for us to pray, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, you've got to have a heart of self-denial, a heart of self-denial. A young man was interviewing a pastor who's been in ministry for a long time. He went to the pastor and he said, Pastor, after all of these years of ministry, after all of these years of serving God, do you still find yourself wrestling with the devil? And the pastor said, oh no, son. After all of these years, I don't find myself wrestling with the devil anymore. Now I find myself wrestling with God. And the young pastor said, Pastor, wrestling with God? What do you hope to win by wrestling with God? And the pastor turned around and said, No, son, I don't hope to win anything by wrestling with God. In fact, I hope I will lose every battle that I wrestle with God. Guys, there are some battles that we need to lose in our spiritual lives. And let me give you two things that we need to lose on a, daily, on a daily basis. Two battles that we need to lose daily. The first battle that we need to lose is with the battle where we are trying to pull God down to our level and make him think that he needs to do things according to the way we want it to be done. The second battle that we need to lose is when God is trying to pull us up to his level and we're resisting that and fighting God when he's trying to take us up to his level so that we could see things from his perspective. These are two battles that we need to lose in our lives on a daily basis. We talk a lot about getting victory over the devil. At some point, we need to start talking about our losses with God. See, this is one of the unfortunate misconceptions of spiritual warfare today. I think we put way too much attention on the devil. We blame the devil for way too much. We give him credit for stuff that he had nothing to do with. Some things that go wrong in our lives have nothing to do with the devil being involved. They have everything to do with the enemy that's in me. It's our flesh. It's our struggle. If I can be honest, the problem is the enemy that's going on inside of me, the struggles that we face internally where we want to be God of our own lives. 
There are some of us in this room, we don't want God. We don't want the God of the Bible. We don't want a relationship with God. We want to be our own God, and we want to use God to help us be better at it. So we just live our lives as practical atheists. When things are going well, we aren't thinking about God. We aren't paying him any attention. We just have him on standby just in case something goes wrong, that God is there to fix our problems. But that's not what God desires. God demands that we acknowledge who he is and submit every area of our life to him. Jesus had two major tests in his life. In Matthew 4, he was taken into the wilderness by the devil and he was tempted And when the devil was tempting him, Jesus began to quote scripture and won the victory over the devil. But the second test that Jesus had was in Matthew 26 in the Garden of Gethsemane. This time he wasn't fighting the devil, and this time he doesn't use scripture. This time he was fighting his own flesh, and he had this open, honest conversation with God, his father. He said, God, I know your desire is to save humanity from their sins. I know your desire is that people would come to know you in relationship again. And I know that the plan includes me going to the cross. But God, if there is a plan B, let's do plan B. I don't want to go to the cross. And so he's open, he's honest, and he's telling God, God, I want to do what you want me to do, but this is not comfortable. And he makes this comment. He says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. See, this is what it means to pray, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because there will, be, there will come times in your life where you have to be honest with God and say, God, I don't like this. God, this hurts. God, this is confusing. God, I don't understand what's going on. God, I don't know what to do. God, I don't want to do this. But there, God, if there's another way for us to go, this, go through this, let's go plan B. But God, I'd love to go with another option. But nevertheless, not my will but your will be done. See, if you're going to say yes to God's will, you have to learn to say the no. You'll have to learn to say no to your agendas, your dreams, your desires, your mindset. No to what you think God ought to do in your life. In 1 Samuel 16, Saul the king had disqualified himself as being king. And God speaks to Samuel and says, Samuel, go to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem. And In that house, one of Jesse's sons will be the new king. And so Samuel goes to Bethlehem and goes to the house of Jesse, and he tells Jesse, Jesse, one of your sons is going to be the new king. And Jesse begins to bring all of his children in front of David, in front of Samuel. And so he brings the first one, and he looks good. He brings the second one, and he looks good. Some of them were so convincing that he even fooled Samuel. Samuel was ready to get up and anoint one of his sons, and God taps him on the shoulders and says, sit down. It is, that's not the one. The way that you're looking at things is not the way that I'm looking at things. You're looking at how well built they are. You're looking at how wise they are. You're looking at how talented they are. But that's not the way that I look at things. You're looking at the outward appearance. I'm looking at the heart. And so Samuel sits down and Jesse brings all of the sons. And eventually all of his sons are on one side. There's none remaining. And there's a conflict between what God said and what um, Samuel saw. God said one of his sons is going to be the king. Jesse says, these are all my sons. And Samuel chooses not to respond to his circumstances by looking at his circumstances, but he chooses to believe in God. And he looks at Jesse and says, Jesse, I know you're telling me that these are all of my kids, all of your kids, but God said one of them are going to be your sons. You got to have one hiding somewhere. And Jesse goes, oh yeah, there's David. And he runs and he gets David. And Samuel gets up and he anoints David as the next king. Listen, Jesse almost missed the blessing of God in his life and in his family because he chose to give God his best instead of giving God everything. Some of us in this room, we give God our best. We give God what he thinks he can use. We think it, we give God those areas of our life where we think we're strong. But God desires not just your best. He desires everything. Some of you in this room say there are parts of your life that God will never use. And God says, in your weakness, I will be made strong. In your brokenness, I will reveal my glory. God desires not just your best. He desires every aspect of your life. 
To pray this prayer means you've got to have a heart of self-denial. Secondly, you've got to have a heart of determined faith. There are three truths that we as believers hold dear to. Number one, that God is good. Number two, God is great. Number three, terrible things happen in this world. You put two of those together, it makes sense. But when you put all three of those things together, it makes no sense at all. That somehow God is good and loving, he's powerful, he can do what he wants, and yet even though those two are true, there's still horrible things that happen. When you put all three of those things together, it makes no sense. And yet we are called to hold in tension those three, three truths. We call it a life of faith. Even when terrible things happen, the heart that can know and do the will of God must trust that God cares for us and that God is able to move on our behalf. That's what Job did. Job got caught in the middle of this bet between God and Satan. Satan goes up to God and says, God, Job, Job only worships you because you're blessing him. God goes, no, he doesn't. And so they finally make a bet. And um, Satan says, let me attack his body. Let me attack his life. And he'll curse you and, and he'll deny you. And Job, God says, all right, do whatever you want. Just don't kill him. And so Job wakes up one morning praying and worshiping God. And by that evening, he's lost everything. He loses his cattle, his sheep, his oxen, his servants, his sons, his daughters. And in the end of chapter 1 of Job, it says, Job got up, he tore his clothes, shaved his head, got back onto the ground, and he began to worship God. Worship God. How can you do that? How can you do that when everything has gone up, fallen apart? How can you worship God? Job answers, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The text ends in chapter 1 by saying that despite all of this, Job never sinned nor charged God foolishly. Even in the midst of greatest of tragedies, Job understood that God is good and his ways are pure. By the way, Job had no idea why he was suffering. Job didn't have the book of Job. He had no idea there was this conversation that was going on in heaven but he still believed that God will do what is best. Listen, you've got to trust the purity of God's character, the purity of God's heart. But not just that, you've got also got to be able to trust the power of God's hand. If you're going to submit to God's will, you've got to trust that not only does God care for you, but that he's also able to work on your behalf. Growing up, one of the stories I learned in Sunday school was the story of David and Goliath classic. I mean, we all love that story. Growing up, I was taught that the story was all about the courage of David, how he was courageous when no one else was courageous. But the more I read that passage and the more I study it and the older I get, I'm less impressed with David's courage. This wasn't about David. This was about God. He wasn't courageous. He just used basic logic. He knew the giant was big, but he also knew that his God was bigger. So he came to a very basic conclusion. It doesn't matter how big Goliath is. If God is bigger, I can go forward and get this victory because I know God is in control of my life. Some of you this morning, you need to hear this. Whatever you're facing in your life, whether it's pain or tragedy or sickness or sorrow or death or heartbreak or injustice, whatever it is, no matter how big it is, your God is much bigger than whatever you're going through. And if God is bigger, whatever the obstacle is, you've got to trust that he is able to see you all the way through. One more point. Let me close. To pray your will be done means to pray that you've got to have a heart is to say that you have a heart of unwavering patience. you got to have a heart of self-denial that says no to self and yes to God. You've got to have a heart of faith that says, God, it hurts, but I trust that you're good and you're faithful and you're able. But you got to have a heart of unwavering patience. If you mean it when you pray, your will be done. You can't pray this and then try to run ahead of God and take over for yourself. Delay doesn't mean denial, but yes doesn't mean right now. To walk in God's will means to walk, wait on God's will. Impatience can lead you out of his will. 
There's a story in Exodus. God had delivered the people out of bondage. He's done incredible miracles on their behalf. The Red Sea has parted, the 10 plagues. God was providing food out of nowhere. All of this great stuff was happening in the lives of the people. And Moses is now at the foot of Mount Sinai, and he goes into the mountain to hear God's voice. And God is speaking to him and giving him the commandments. And while he is up there, the people are getting impatient on the bottom. And so finally they come to Aaron, Moses' brother, and says, Aaron, build us a God that will lead us into the promised land, because we're getting tired of waiting for Moses. And so Aaron finally relents, and he builds them this statue, this golden calf, and the people begin to worship and dance in front of this God. Moses comes down, and you guys have seen Ten Commandments with his two big stones, and he throws it at the calf, and it destroys the people. God judges and punishes the people. Listen, the people of God were judged for idolatry that began with their impatience with what God was doing in their life. Impatience will lead you into greater sins. To pray your will be done is to trust that God's timing in your life is perfect. To walk in his will, you've got to wait on his will. This is what the psalmist reminds us numerous times in the book of Psalms. Psalms 27, wait for the Lord, be strong. Let your heart take courage, wait for the Lord. The prophet Isaiah says, but they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Psalms 40, Bryce looked at it several weeks ago. The first verse says this. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. That's all I did. I waited patiently for the Lord. The psalmist says, that's all I had to do. I didn't wait and complain. I didn't wait and try to rush God. I didn't wait and bicker. I just sat there and I waited and I waited and waited. That's all I did. Listen, this is why God allows some things to happen in our lives. You want to know why God allows you to go through what you go through? Sometimes God allows things to happen in his providence because he doesn't want you to trusting in government or your education or your job or your career or your family or your friends or your bank account. Sometimes he allows everything you are depending on to fall around you and fail because you have nowhere else to turn but to him. Because if you have somewhere else, you're going to look at your clock and say, I'm tired of waiting, and you're going to try to get ahead of God. So God allows everything to fall apart where you have no other option but to sit there and wait on God. The psalmist says, the only thing I did was wait on God. I didn't do anything else. And here's what God did for me. Because I waited, he inclined his ear toward me. He heard my cry. He picked my feet up out of the miry clay. And he set my feet on a rock to stay. He put a new song in my mouth. He did all of that, and the only thing I did was wait on his perfect timing for my life. You can't walk in God's will if you can't wait on God's will. Max Ocato, in his book, Gentle Thunder, writes that as he's writing the book, his daughter is in the other room practicing piano. She's in her second year of piano, so she's past the stage of nursery rhymes. The notes are sharper, the rhythms are more difficult, the chords change. She's past the stage of simply doing one key at a time, and she's struggling. She would rather be anywhere else but in front of that piano. She'd rather be out playing with her friends, out anywhere doing anything else but the piano. But he makes her stay there. He makes her struggle. Why? Is he unloving? Is he insensitive? Is he uncaring? No. But he makes her stay there because daddy knows that struggle today will produce music tomorrow. Listen, some of you are going through stuff in your life, and you need to hear this. Struggle today will produce music tomorrow. Some of you are testimonies of that. You've gone through struggles and hardships and difficulties, and you waited and you trusted God, and you can look back and you say, there's music playing in my life today, but I had to go through incredible struggles and pain and hardship for God to produce the music that he's producing in my life today. Struggle today will produce music tomorrow. But here's the good news. You don't have to do this by yourself. See, when you run to the cross and when you put your faith in Jesus, 
You're not the beneficiary of just a divine plan for your life, but you're also divinely enabled to accomplish that plan. God empowers you with the Holy Spirit so that you can do the things that he wants for your life. Do you realize that in the Bible, when, you, when it speaks about God's will, God's will is presented both as a noun and a verb. A noun and a verb. A noun, it's a plan or a place or a destination for your life. God's will is that you will reach X. But it's also a verb. It's a promise. God will provide. God will take care. When it's relation to God's will, it's both a noun and a verb. The verb is a promise. The noun is God's plan for your life. Let me show this to you. If you do God's will, God will take care of you. Second Chronicles 7, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Jeremiah 33, call unto me, and I will show you great and mighty things. Matthew 16, 18 and 19, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Philippians 4, 6 and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. James 4, 10. And humble yourselves under the hand of Almighty God, and He will exalt you in due time. Revelations 4.21 says that when this life is over and we see our Savior face to face, He will wipe every tear from our eyes, and that shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. If you will do what God is calling you to do, He will take care of you. Listen, I know... You don't get excited about that because you want to know plan A and plan B. How God is going to do what he's going to do is none of your business. That's his business. Your business is simply to trust and obey. And if you give it to God, somehow he will take care of you. Somehow he will put food on your table. If you give it to God, somehow he will put roof over your head. Somehow he will make sure you have a job to take care of your family. Somehow he will protect your children. Somehow he will make sure you graduate. Somehow he will provide for you. Somehow he will keep you in good health. Somehow he'll protect you when, when your life should fall apart. Somehow he will take care of you. This morning, some of you need to hear this because you're struggling and wondering where is God in my life why is why am I going through what I'm going through can I remind you and encourage you struggle today will produce music tomorrow the greatest evidence that we have a God who loves us is the table that we're about to celebrate every week we come to the table and we recognize that the body and blood of Jesus was spilt because when we had no way to get to heaven, when we had no way to pay for our sins, God took our place and he provided us salvation. Listen, if he could do that, if he can guarantee us eternity with him, he is much more than able to take care of your daily needs. Some of you are fighting battles with God that you need to lose. And this morning, you need to lose those battles. You need to stop trying to pull God down to your level, trying to make him understand things from your perspective. And you also need to stop fighting God when he's trying to pull you to his level where you can see from his perspective. You need to lose some battles this morning. Some of you this morning need to say no to yourself. You're fighting God because your dreams, your desires, you're not willing to surrender them at the feet of God. Can I encourage you? The best thing you can do is surrender. Because two things. Number one, he loves you. Number two, he knows your future. He knows what's ahead. And he will take care of you. He will watch over you. He will provide for you. Some of you are busy trying to rush God this morning, saying, God, work when work now. And God's saying, no. 
I'm going to produce music through your life, but that's going to take some time. So you need to be patient. Some of you, your faith, you don't believe that God is able or that God cares for you. And this morning, you need to be reminded that no matter what you go through in your life, you have a God who loves you. You have a God that's bigger than whatever obstacle you're facing. As we come to the table this morning, I'm going to invite you to examine your heart, examine your attitudes, your affections, your desires. See if there's anything in your life that's not from God. And if there is, would you repent? And you, would you run to the throne of grace that's ready and available for you? And would you just say, God, help me. Help me to die to myself. Help me to have undying, unwavering faith. And God, teach me patience. Help me to trust so that my prayer would be, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As you examine your hearts and examine your affections and desires and you need to repent and you need to have your time with God, when you are ready, I'm going to invite you to come to the table and grab the elements, come back to your seats, and we'll pray together. Father, this morning, I pray that your spirit would convict us of things in our lives that are not like you. Forgive us of not trusting you. Forgive us of trying to rush you. Forgive us of caring more about ourselves than we care about what you desire for us. Mold us, shape us, work in us, transform us so that we would be like Jesus and that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As we come to this table, we're reminded again of your great love for us. We love you. It's in Jesus' name.